Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Thrive Co-Living podcast and YouTube broadcast. Thrive Co-Living is a new concept in creative community building. Sustainable, multicultural, multi-generational, and inclusive, Thrive Co-Living communities are built from repurposed big box stores or other suitable buildings. In this series, myself, Jennifer Hooper, and Thrive founder, Mark Stein, will weave together the tapestry that makes up the physical and spiritual components of this new concept in community living. Now on with the show. Okay, so welcome back, everybody, to the Thrive Co-Living podcast, uh, YouTube and podcast. You can find it on YouTube, which is probably where you found it, and on any of your, uh, on Apple, iTunes, uh, Google Play, anywhere that uh, audio podcasts are found. I have two guests with me today, uh, Molly Schulte, Schulte Tucker and Rob Tucker, and they are a married ministerial tag team, um, and I'm going to let them tell you a little bit about their ministry, but first let me tell you how we met uh, pre-COVID on the plane, and I don't remember what it was that sparked the conversation, but we started talking, and we talked from uh, wheels up to wheels down uh, pretty much, and um, uh, really got uh, to liking both of them. Molly has uh, agreed to serve on our uh, Thrive Advisory Board. So uh, she's been a supporter for from very early on, actually both of them. Um, and they've just reunited. They were in different cities for a while. But I'll let them tell you a little bit about uh, their ministry. And then we're, the topic today is to talk about religion in the Thrive co-living communities. Uh, will it work? Will it be uniting? Will it be divisive? Are there ways to make it healthy for everyone? Um, so I'm really glad to have both of them on to talk about this. So welcome to both of you. And how about telling a little bit, each of you, you're in uh, separate churches, different churches. So talk a little bit about your, your practice and your mission. Okay. I'll let you I'll, go first. I'll go first. All right. Um, I'm Molly Schulte Tucker. I am the pastor at Ridgewood Baptist Church. That's in Southwest Louisville. We are right in the heart of PRP. Uh, we refer to ourselves as a little progressive gym in Southwest Louisville. Um, I started here at Ridgewood on January 1st of this year. So it's here about two months before a pandemic changed the world. <laughs> um, prior to this position, I've been in, um, in music ministry and a little touch of youth ministry. Um, Ridgewood, as, as you can probably tell, I am female and Ridgewood is a Baptist church. And a lot of people don't know that these things can happen together at the same time, but we are cooperative Baptists. We're part of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And we are part of the um, American Baptist Convention um, as well. Both of those have similar uh, makeups. I, just to give a little bit of descriptor on what the CBF is, um, most folks have heard of the Southern Baptist Church. In the 80s into the 90s, uh, the powers that be of the Southern Baptist Convention decided that women should not be in leadership among some other strong statements about who belonged in leadership in the church and whatnot. And when the Southern Baptist Church took a hard turn uh, apart from women, some other folks said, we're going to make our own <laughs> Baptist fellowship. And so that's, that's where the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship has come about. So uh, typically they are more accepting uh, and inclusive. And even some churches, uh, not all churches, but, but a lot of churches say that they're even progressive in their thinking as far as inclus inclusion of women and LGBTQIA community. Um, so I, I love where I'm at. I love what I do. Um, I, I, I feel like I always have to say, too, I grew up in a minister's family. I have a brother who is a minister, so it's in my blood. Um, 
yeah, and I love I love talking about the church. So thanks for inviting us. Great, thank you. Usually the minister's kids are the bad yes. kids. We they go, go there's they go crazy. <laughs> there's so. It's one or the other. There is right. rarely an in-between. <laughs> and probably just, phases between each one as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> just like a lot of times there's a lawyer or a judge and a bank robber in the same family. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Got to rebel somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Thank you. Rob, how about you? Talk a little bit about your path. Yeah. So I'm Rob Tucker and I'm the lead pastor at Watkins United Methodist Church, which is in East Louisville. It is a United Methodist congregation, so uh, married to a Baptist and am a Methodist, and so we can somewhat make, you know, differing opinions last. We'll see. <laughs> um, but I grew up in Florida uh, and spent most of my life there, and so it's getting cold here before we started really the, the podcast talking with Mark. I was uh, lamenting that the cold was coming and my hands were already cold, and it's time to hibernate. And so that's what I'm looking forward to in the next couple of months. Um, I've been a pastor uh, for about five years uh, in full-time ministry, serving two other churches, one in Florida and one in Owensboro, Kentucky, as associate pastors at large membership churches and then coming here. Um, the United Methodist Church, just distinguishing factors are we have everybody under the sun that becomes the United Methodist. It's known as kind of a, a big tent denomination where uh, both the, the Clintons and the Bushes are members of the United Methodist Church. And so um, Watkins, the congregation which I serve now since July, so I transitioned during the midst of a global health pandemic. Um, strange, the church is all online now, but um, just it, it represents that kind of diversity of thought and, and theology and politic. Um, and that's what it is. And I think, Mark, what happened on that airplane on that day um, I can't help but talk to people on airplanes. It pro annoys Molly to no end. Um, if I'm sitting, I think I was sitting in the middle seat that day, and I just can't help but spark up a conversation. But I don't know if I started it or you started it, because I was reading a book, and, and I was trying to think all day what book it was. I was reading the book, The Art of Neighboring. And I think you brought up like, well, that's an interesting title. Tell me more. Um, so I think it was you who started it this time. So I got off the hook. I wasn't that guy. <laughs> Rob will talk to a, Rob will talk to a brick wall. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and so. I'll have a great conversation. Getting well. <laughs> well, and and we, t you and I, Molly, talked over him quite a bit of the conversation, <laughs> yeah. more through through him. So that's right. right. <laughs> yep. Well, so again, thanks to both of you uh, for being here, and let's just kick it off. Um, and I. Um, you know, I, I, let's let's argue, not argue, but let's talk about both sides of the of the spectrum, how it could work and how it could be helpful and healing and uh, uniting, and ways that it could be the opposite. And you know, I, I let's just approach it that way. Um, and why don't we? Let's see. Why don't we? Should we start with the negatives? the negative potentials, that way we end with the positive? Sure. Okay. So, and, and, you know, through it all, you know, what you're, where you're leaning uh, about it. You both understand what Thrive is about and, uh, you know, just where, where you're leaning. So, who wants to start? You guys are fighting over who starts. Molly, you start. <laughs> I'll, you want me to start? So this is, so kind of our negative take on it, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it is, um, so Rob and I were talking about this earlier this week as we were kind of thinking through this stuff. Um, you know, the, the church for centuries has served as, whether it's a church or just any, any religious institution, has served as um, a meeting point for people in communities. Um, so, you know, whether it's a, a church, a synagogue, a mosque, et cetera, it's where people come to gather, you know, everyone in their individual houses, and then they come to this meeting point. And, and even, even what, what we were talking about earlier this week, um, even the, the order of worship that we hand out in a church is called a bulletin, um, the same as 
a news bulletin, right? So it had the events in the life of the church, but it also listed, you know, this baby was born or here's what's happening with the school board or, or, or what have you. So, so the church for, and even the church bells, right? In the middle of the, in the middle of towns or, or when, you know, when certain Falling. events started. Yeah. Um, those served as the centrality of community life for, for centuries, especially, I'm, I'm specifically thinking of American Christian history, but even into European Christian history. Um, and, I, and I wonder, all of that to say, I think that we have, over the course of hundreds of years, developed and found other things that draw us together from our homes. Um, so, um, I, I wonder if it would be, if, if to have a religion in a community that is formed because of other shared values, um, if that could create, um, almost a, a certain divisiveness within the community, um, because of, of different denominations, different religions, um, even even in our household, we have two different denominations, and and we uh, and we'll not bicker over them, but we will you know talk back and forth about them all the time. Um, so yeah, I wonder if it would create more of a attention than a collective gathering place. I think at some point along the way, um, church became this uh, competition between the other, and I think there's this competition that they feel like, and, and this isn't every church, but I would say it's the majority of the American church. Um, we possess the truth and you don't, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there becomes this uh, competition between, hey, I have it, you don't have it. You must come over here to receive it from me um, because where you're going, well, that's, that's really not teaching the right things. Um, and that kind of this claim for, and, and this is particularly happening inside the United Methodist Church, so I can this, this is what's dividing the church right now is this kind of fight for orthodoxy. Um, what is the truth? What is orthodox? What is, um, what does the tradition say? And, and how does this live out within our communities? Um, the United Methodist Church is on the brink of splitting and, and will most likely split within the next year. And, and that's just one denomination. If you put in other denominations, then you put in other religions. Um, sometimes you see this all throughout history. It becomes the quest for truth. And this quest becomes a battle, um, not only within, but outside to say, I have the authority, because I think it's usually a reach for power. Um, <laughs> I have the power, and therefore, um, you do not. And you must come to my teachings in order to do that. So I, what I've seen in, in different kind of co-living communities is kind of this could be, you know, this competition between the two to say, um, well, you're not, you know, I met this, you're not cooperative Baptist, you're not. Southern Baptist, you're not evangelical, you're not, you know, um, and so therefore you need to learn from me. Um, and, and I think sometimes that creates a very unhealthy spiral <laughs> within religion, religious institutions themselves and outside of it. Right. And, you know, I think the people that will be drawn to thrive will be naturally more, more open, more accepting, more embracing, um, mm -hmm. You know, we're going to make it clear that we were inclusive uh, of of all cultures. Uh, it'll be multi generational, and so I think they will come to this with an uh, with openness. But then, as I'm playing it out in my head and envisioning it, I think it could that once you hit that belief, somebody voices a belief that's just far enough away from my own, let me say, mm -hmm. um, and just rubs me the wrong way mm -hmm. that all the kumbaya could just fade away, you know? And it, and it, could, be over, it could be over gender. It could be um, a gay person should be able to do this in their religion, but not this. Here's the line, you know? And then whenever, then, I could see it really rubbing people the wrong way. Um, and even those who consider themselves very tolerant. So, mm -hmm. um, Step into a local church 
and you and, and even progressive local churches um, can still bicker around the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. <laughs> you know, like they can still even the easiest things. Well, we can come to an agreement about this. There's almost this internal want, this internal striving to be proven right in the amongst of other people. Um, and even if you would say claim the most uh, tolerant, inclusive, acceptive um, place of belonging as the church should be, um, there's still that kind of it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's also a, for local congregations, there's also um, there's a choice to go to a faith community. Um, and, and typically among among younger generations, um, millennials especially what I'm thinking, but, but, but even younger, um, no one is going to go to a congregation without Googling them or looking up their Facebook or their Instagram, you know, no one is going to do that. So, um, there is, um, there is a choice in, in where people go. Um, and I think some part of me thinks unless you're prepared to have, a denomination of one, you know, in, in your, in your, in, in a co-living space, you know, you're going to have so many different shades, um, within that space of what people believe. Um, I've also, I was also thinking when Rob was talking about, um, way back, well, I mean, I guess still currently too, there are, there are monasteries, um, Christianity has done, in a sense, co-living well for a long, long time. Um, but I think the crux of that is the draw to that is religion and is the understanding of, um, of a similar understanding of faith before even joining it. So, um, so even though I think faithful living together is is possible and is historical and is still happening um the starting point between a monastery and a co-living community as far as religion are, are totally different right and the 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 main principles that people will be gathering there under are not religion <clears throat> they're right. they're not coming there for religion um so they they could either be unprepared. Well, I don't think they're going to be unprepared because we're going, we're going to be really clear on this, mm -hmm. what, however it turns out before the first brick is laid. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but I think you're right. There, people are coming to a particular monastery, church, uh, mosque uh, for that purpose, and they right. know what they're coming, what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. Or they learn really quickly what they're going to get yeah, the first yeah. day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's, yeah, there's an, but there is also an intentionality of shared belief systems. Um, and, I, and I do think a, a co-living community already has a lot of different, you know, set in place belief systems that people um, will agree to. And I don't think that's religious. Um, although I, I would argue it's all spiritual, whether it's um, coming from any kind of perspective, you're coming to this place. We know it's not just um, human bodies living together. There's some kind of connectivity going on. I would call that flow the divine, right? But they are agreeing to a shared belief system in there that they will only sign up for if they want to be a part of it. And I think that's great. Um, I, I Yelp everything. <laughs> I Google another thing that irritates Molly. He does. I everything. Google <laughs> and Yelp and like we won't go to a restaurant unless I have read 20 reviews of it. It's um, obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it'll take us a long time to figure out where we're going to dinner because I'm going to look into it first. I don't think I'm the only one alone in that. Now maybe I'm extreme and I understand that. Yes. Um, so but, one bad review, one bad review <laughs> and it's out. Well, I mean, yeah, I'll give it away. I, you know, the top and the bottom you get rid of and you're trying to figure okay. out what's the, the in between. Uh, it's also very scientific. And the pictures help too. Oh, um, yeah. But like you, I'll look into a place because of what it values and what, what it says. Other people said, hey, here's what the environment was like. Um, here was the vibe that I got from this restaurant. And then that's why I'll pick it. Um, and I, I do think that's the same way, especially more intentionally with a, a co-living creation here of a community, um, people will be looking into something because it has a, a, a fits uh, their shared belief system to some extent in their lives. Mm 
Yeah. Um, so let's say let's say we we come down on the side of it's just not going to work. There would be there would be twelve denominations of Christianity, <laughs> and then it it would just it, there would be a number of clusters. So let's just say we we don't think it can work. So what we then do is prohibit anything related to religion in Thrive. Um, so think about that vibe, you know, oh, everything else is cool, um, uh, but not religion. So then somebody wants to organize a yoga class or a mindfulness meditation, ecumenical, non-denominational mindfulness meditation or yoga stretches and then somebody is going to say damn it <laughs> yoga is rooted in whatever it's rooted hindu culture and you're bringing religion in there or somebody's what somebody in as a, as a habit says a prayer before the meal because they're facilitating the meal and it's got Buddhism in it, you know? So it's, so that could be a consequence if you say, no, we're not going to have promotion of religion. So we're going to prohibit it. And boy, could that, you know, mm -hmm. could that wreak havoc too? Yeah. What do you think? That, yeah, that's totally, that could happen. That's true. Um, I think, um, well, two, two things that it kind of made me think of is, um, one is, you know, I think we can't assume that anyone would move in who doesn't already have instilled religious beliefs of, of their own, um, or lack thereof. And that's okay too, you know, wherever they are, um, and if, if part of being known by the community is that part of their identity is their faith, then that is, that is their, um, I feel like in a way that that is, that should be their freedom um, to, to express that part of themselves. Um, now, as a pastor, I am not going to intentionally move into a co-living community thinking I'm going to start a church here, or I'm going to bring all these people to my church, or um, I'm going to convert all these people to, my, you know, there's, there's a difference between, I think, expressing something that is part of you and um, almost like an underhanded, maybe that's a strong word, <laughs> but an underhanded push to draw people into a certain religion. Um, what about just the word proselytizing? Yeah, so. like that. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I would want, I mean, if I was living there, I would want people to know I'm a pastor. You know, this is what I do. I'm, I'm not going to try to convert you to come to my church because this is where I'm living. This isn't where I've, um, this isn't where I've said I'm working. This is where I'm going to live. Um, um, and my church is where I'm going to minister to people um, and, and in the community around a church. But this is where I've committed to live. Um, and it's important that you know this about me but also know that there are boundaries. Yeah. I think you have to be careful in the value of culture, in the value of culture and, and, and a kind of a mutual respect around um, what we care deeply about and how we show how much we care about that. Right. Does that make sense? I think when it's something that's so ingrained inside of majority of people um, is some kind of a spiritual connection and whatever name we want to place upon that spiritual connection. And it, it, our comfortability, especially when we live um, where we call quote unquote home um, is where it's an outpouring of that, right? That's an outpouring of what we value, what we love, what we care deeply for. Um, sure. Pastoring may be something that, that Molly and I have devoted our lives to. Um, but I don't think, and the problem is with Christianity, majority of this, we've just become, you know, particularly salesmen for Jesus, right? We've kind of been, who's the next great recruiter for heaven? And that's what majority, I would say, of American Christians, specifically in the South, 
have a pic depiction of a pastor in their mind, right? I typically don't like to share um, that I'm a pastor when I'm beside somebody in an airplane. Mark, I don't know how you got that out of us. You got both of them. We say we're teachers. We usually say we're <laughs> history teachers because we kind of are. Yeah. Because there's a, a bad taste in people's mouth for what Christianity, particularly uh, ministers, can be. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that the outpouring of what we believe and hold to be true um, can't be something uh, a beautifully um, expressed in community. Um, because I do think what well, I may name something as, as God, or I may name something as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I feel like you probably may have a different name for that. And, and for me, that's a deep connection with you because I want to express that. I want to have conversations about it. I'm not going to beat you over the head with the Bible um, because then I'm really not a Christian if that's my <laughs> instincts. Um, but I'm going to love you. And so, and, and I think at the core of every religion we find is that expressive of, of loving God and loving others. Um, not in a way of a conversion, not in a way of, of combativeness, but a way in which we do life together because that's who God, who whatever we may call that God calls us to do. Um, see the beauty in the other, see the justice in this world, see um, equality flowing throughout our systems and where we live can have a, an extraordinary impact on that. Yeah, and you know, even, even people that are spiritual, don't even claim to be religious, um, or and people that that are anti-religion, but uh, fervent in their let's just say their humanism. Mm -hmm. um, but people want to ex express that, you know, and expressing that in your home and in your in your interaction and in your community is a big part. So I don't think there's even if we tried to prohibit it, and I don't think we can, and I don't think we should, but I think we want to encourage whatever that divine energy is coming from people, they, the people that will be uh, joining Thrive will want to express that. Mm -hmm. And we will want to, we'll want to feel that and we'll want to embrace that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that feeling and, and it's that feeling that um, that extends beyond denomination, beyond religious borders, um, and that I think many of us feel when we are when we meet somebody of a different religion and connect um, spiritually. Um, you know, we want to express that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the key is how do you foster an environment in which that is celebrated? Um, not forced upon, but in an ability in which people are able to freely express those things and have a deep connection with one another um, because of a, a shared belief system of some sort. Um, but I do think that there's an intentionality of saying this, we foster this, we encourage it. Um, but there, there's also boundaries. Boundaries are not a bad thing, you know, when it comes to these kind of conversations and expressiveness. But also, you know, what ways does this look like for us, for the good, for the betterment of the whole? Um, how does this create a culture um, that we're able to do that in community with each other? So maybe let's use that as a segue. And not that we, we won't come back to the negative, but let's use it as a segue for the positive and what could happen. Um, and how it could be unifying. And I think where you're heading, Rob, is so what if we, what if we were open to other people's ideas, um, open to, their, to hearing what their beliefs are as a way to inform ours, fine tune ours? Um, could we celebrate each other's religious traditions, you know, and have, have the community Seder and have, you know, have all of the, the uh, expressions, the holidays of religions. I, have, I work with quite a few Indian companies, um, not Native American, but India Indian. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about it, about their culture, is that they celebrate almost all holidays. Now, part of it is that they don't take vacations. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, their, that's their break. And if they fall adjacent to a weekend, they go home, but they celebrate. There, there are probably five or six religions 
uh, whose holidays they all celebrate. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, maybe that gets pulled into it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on how you can do it positively where it's a, a healing, unifying celebration uh, and not divisive? What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I, I had a, uh, this is what me, made me go to is I had a really unique, um, I think unique experience growing up in Louisville. Um, the school I went to was not, was not extremely racially diverse, um, and really not economically diverse. Um, but it was religiously diverse and I grew up with friends who were Jewish and Hindu and Sikh and Muslim. And, um, and that is something that I think I still carry with me. Um, even as a Christian pastor, um, because there, I think in, in living with these other students, it created a space in me for the other, um, that I'm allowed to have a belief and hearing someone else's belief doesn't mean I have to fight them. It doesn't mean I have to prove them wrong. Um, but um, because they are who they are, I have figured out who I am um, and where I stand on religion and theology. Even in uh, the early stages of our relationship, when Rob and I realized we are different denominations, um, once I, once I figured out who I was, um, partly it was because I was delineating from who Rob was, but I still married him. So it's still important to me. Um, and I don't come home every night and say, well, you're wrong. <laughs> I might, but it's usually not because of that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say, huh? so, <laughs> um, but I do think when we, when we meet people who are not like us, um, it is, it is, um, I remember growing up and going to bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and with my dad, who was a pastor and my mom, who was a teacher and, you know, a pastor's wife. And, and we're all sitting there and, and supportive of this process that's going on. That's so important in this person's life, not because we're going to become Jewish, but because we love these people apart from the religion that they, that they practice. Um, and I would think that they think the same of us too. So um, there's just a, a mutual, I think, understanding and respect and love, even when you don't share the same articulation of God in the world. Yeah, I, I did not grow up in a very diverse um, religious community. Um, I grew up in Brooksville, Florida, an hour north of Tampa. Um, and really, like if you weren't a practicing Christian, however you wanted to find that, um, then you're really an outsider. You're really an outsider. And, then, and, and that was uh, and, and not a good thing. You know, it was this weird judgmental. I, growing up, uh, I don't know if I can share this out loud without being judged too much. I had a 10-inch mohawk, right, when I was in high school. And I had piercings and gauges and um, <laughs> it was all different colors. Yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> embarrassing photos from back in the day. But I still like it. Still like, well, Molly doesn't let me pull that off anymore. <laughs> Um, mainly because I'm losing hair now. I don't think you have enough hair, babe. It just doesn't uh, look good. I'm not so, so Sorry. Okay. Um, but like that, there was a differentiation between the two, right? And I did not look like the church going boy. Um, and so when I started playing, I play music. So I started playing guitar and drums and, and churches because they would invite me. Um, I always got these weird judgmental looks, right? And always, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times they tried to save me. Um, still trying to save me, probably. Uh, and it's just, for me, it was such as an alienating experience um, that really made me question a call to any kind of ordained ministry after that, because I was like, why in the world would I want to be a part of them? Um, it wasn't until college where I started to meet um, various folks from all over the country, all over the world. I started, you know, living in the same hallways as people who have drastically different experiences than me growing up. Um, that I started to really figure out who I am. Because I, I agree absolutely with Molly here. When you start to really understand people's differences as, as, a, as a beautiful, I think, God-given um, experiences, you, you know, you start to really discern, oh, maybe I do fit into this world. And this world is not as, as, as small 
and as you know exclusive as I had thought, but rather than this kind of beautifully of walking each other throughout this journey together, um, that that's where I really started saw, started to see me fitting in. Um, I, now I am a, a Christian pastor, pastor, and I'm, I'm usually a majority as a as a white male, to be honest with you, and um, that does it. I have to be able then for me to force myself sometimes in situations where there are the other and be able to listen in ways um, that creates character within me and creates um, this, my own kind of longing and yearning. I have a longing yearning for diversity now. Um, I remember we were uh, in, in Justice Square, uh, Molly and I went to uh, for Breonna Taylor's death and, and we went down there and we're a part of the protest as a part of the clergy and, and folks have had called us in to be able to come. And um, there's some white supremacists supposed to be showing up across the way. And we were supposed to create this kind of healing barrier. And it wasn't just Christian, but there's people from all different faiths. And we had this wonderful conversations with folks um, from people all from all different faiths. And, and, and for me, there's again, another kind of enlightening around the other um, that I could listen and really sparked um, something within me to be around people who, who don't think or don't believe um, the same things that I do. And, and, and that's a okay. And, and I think people who want to be a part of something weird, like a co-living community, something very different than the, the usual experience that people have, they'll want, ha- want to have that longing because it is different. And, and once we've figured out, hey, we were created to engage in communities like this, um, then we'll really start to play into the celebration of the other. Um, not that it's a threat to my existence at all, but it's really makes my existence way more beautiful than it was the day before. Um, I think once we start to see differences as a, as a celebration, um, we'll be at a completely different, maybe we need to start planting these co-living communities all over the country, right? <laughs> I mean, to be able to, we're, we're in a hard place right now as a country because we just don't know how to celebrate the other. We don't know how to listen to the other um, because we don't, we're not around the other. We're not in proximity. I think there's something sacred to place. We're not in proximity to the other. Therefore, we don't hear them. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't care. Um, they're not even on our Facebook <laughs> right. uh, mm-hmm. pages. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. we're so diverse. What, um, what did not, was there a denomination, Rob, that was dominant in the town that you grew up in? Oh, yeah. Um, the Southern Baptists had a monopoly on, on Brooksville, Florida. Um, and when I came to faith, uh, I came to faith through a Southern Baptist church in high school. Um, and I'm grateful for folks who had a spiritual impact on me growing up, but I really had to deconstruct a lot of that faith that was handed to me throughout college because I met people different than me. I met people <laughs> um, who read scripture a little bit different than me. I read people who had a different uh, faith, religious background than me. And the, really the faith I was, the faith or the doctrine or whatever you want to call it, the theology given to me really didn't work. <laughs> I signed up for a, a, one of my favorite stories as I accidentally, I'm, I'm not very smart. I accidentally signed up for a bio for majors course um, in college. And I didn't mean to click on that one. I thought it was just biology 101, but it was for majors. And I almost flunked that thing. Um, it was so hard, but I learned so much. And what I was learning in these classes came to really contradict what I would have been given in my faith tradition. Um, and, I, and I had to somehow wrestle with that and come to a different place. And th- that different place was, was leaving behind um, some of the faith I was given and really reconstructing something that was more um, uh, value of the other, really allowing other sources to fill my life um, alongside, I would say, my biblical worldview, um, because it's all connected. And so in what ways can I flourish within that? Yeah. One of our one of our theology professors when we were in seminary uh, talked about how we all go through this shattering of our of our faith and our belief. Um, at some point, something is going to rock your world, um, and in the moments after the shattering, you know you're picking up the different splinters of what you used to believe and trying to keep some and put them together. But it's um, a reformation of of faith and belonging and sense of self and sense of God um, that we're constantly doing as we move forward. It's not a one-time event, but, but we're constantly remaking ourselves and our beliefs. Um, I think that uh, one thing that politics and or religion, a, a com- either one or a combination thereof, have taught us that we, we cannot have conflict. We cannot 
um, let people see our, our, we can't have anger. We, you know, we, that's an intimate emotion. Um, and, but what if we have staying power through that? You know, what if, what if our relationships can actually deepen because we're vulnerable, vulnerable enough to say, this is what I believe. And, and I don't really know what to do with this right now. Or I really like what you believe too. I think there's truth and, and there's maybe something holy in what you believe too, even though it's never anything I heard, you know, in my pew. Um, so I think, um, yeah, there's, there has to be some vulnerability along the way of maybe we don't have it all right. Mm -hmm. Since you both were generous uh, to share about uh, your upbringing, let me share a little bit uh, from mine too and sort of round it out. <clears throat> so I was reared Jewish, reformed Jewish in Columbus, Georgia, um, which was Southern Baptist uh, centered, of course, there were some uh, Catholics, and we were sort of, the Jews and the Catholics were sort of viewed similarly um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the, the length of the horns that were likely to be coming <laughs> out of our heads. Um, and uh, so there were a hundred Jewish families in Columbus, Georgia, mm -hmm. six Jewish kids my age, and of course, the Jewish parents wanted the Jewish kids to marry uh, other Jewish kids. And so it was like, and I went to nursery school with those four, three or four girls. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so it was a very secular env uh, environment. Um, the only animosity I ever saw was when I got out for the Jewish holidays and got out for the Christian holidays too out of school that uh, that was that was it in terms of of negative vibes but I will tell you this story so um, my girlfriend in high school went to a one of the big Southern Baptist churches um, white columns the typical looking church TV big TV church huge denomination uh, or huge congregation and I very intentionally did not sign the guest card that was passed around because I did not want to call attention to myself. So it's time for the first hymn. And the preacher minister says, okay, the, we're going to read from this hymn and it's on page 253. Well, in the Jewish temple that I grew up in, when the hymn was announced, you pop up you find the hymn in the hymnal and then everybody sings it. So he announces it. I pop up. I'm right in the center of this <laughs> church. And of course, I'm the only person standing because they're sitting looking for the hymn. <laughs> and then by the time I slithered back down into my seat, everybody else is standing, of course. <laughs> so I, I was... And on TV, I popped up in the middle of this church. Um, and the, the minister at the door uh, telling everyone goodbye said, oh, I'm so happy you came. So good to have newcomers. So I just announced my, <laughs> my <laughs> newness by uh, popping up in the middle of the church. So anyway. <clears throat> and you Sorry. belted out that solo like no other <laughs> business, right? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what else around this? What have we missed around this topic? So we're, I think we're saying if there's a way to celebrate it and celebrate the diversity um, and not have it be divisive, that that might be best. Uh, that's sort of what I'm hearing as our consensus um, uh, any other thoughts around this topic that we haven't talked about? I don't think so. It's been a pretty good conversation. Great conversation. I, you know, I was preaching a sermon yesterday or two days ago now, I guess. Uh, but I don't even know what day of the week, oh, day yeah. of the week it is now in COVID. I really lost track of time. <laughs> Um, and, and it was on uh, friendless and alone. And so I talked a lot about loneliness and isolation and the effects it has on our, on our human bodies. And the way it really, um, the feeling of being alone uh, 
deteriorates from the, uh, the inside out of us, no matter who we are, right? Um, it has the same effect of, of I think the, the common thing is of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, right? That isolation can be that damaging on us. Um, and I think what a, a gift this just provides, particularly from, uh, like I said, I'll go back to the phrase before, everything is spiritual. Going back on that, it, how much gifting this can bring to the sacred inside of each one of us. Um, to be connected with the other, because without it, we deteriorate. Without it, we become um, this, this, no one is self-independent. I know it, the, we've all been brought from something out of human bodies and created to be around other human bodies to have it a shared mutual experience that is living. Um, and if we want this living to be full, I think we have to, um, no matter what faith tradition we bring into it, we, it's all mandated to be together. <laughs> it's all mandated to be um, with the other. Um, and, and so I, I just, just going back and just celebrating this, this idea that you have, Mark, um, the rest of the board of directors to, to have um, this yearning for connectivity um, is crucial to our, our physical, our spiritual, our mental well-being. And I think when, as we're coming out of COVID, and I don't think we are yet, but when we do, I think it will lead to an even greater appreciation of what community is about, uh, the, the main thing that I miss, I'm an introvert and I'm happy to work at my computer most of the time, but I do miss the hugs, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, but I do think that as we come out of this, there'll be an, a, a greater appreciation for togetherness and unity and acceptance, not, not by everybody, but I think those for whom it's important um, will be drawn to it even more. Um, the, the irony of promoting a co-living community in the middle of, of a pandemic has not escaped me. <laughs> and, and a lot of people do uh, mention it, but I think that on the other side will be that. So I had an idea that, that came to me about two thirds of the way through our conversation. Let me just test it out on you. What if we treated religion or framed religion in, at Thrive as culture, because I don't think there's going to be any controversy about uh, having uh, Italian celebrations with the food and, and celebrating different cultures, nationalities and, and cultures. Um, I don't think anybody is going to object to that. And I think that people would be encouraging of somebody from Bavaria to share their food and their <laughs> history. And I do envision that we'll have, um, you know, we'll have people doing presentations about all sorts of things and sharing their experience about all sorts of things. What if we treated Buddhism or Islam, just like China. My background is in China. You know, I grew up in China and here's what it's like to be there. And that we didn't inflate religion above culture, but just treated it as part of culture. Could that, what do you think? That, I mean, I think that sounds like a good um, kind of middle ground of it. Um, and I think that there, there are, you know, um, there are some, <laughs> one of my best friends from, from undergrad is a, is culturally Catholic, but <laughs> not practicing or, but not religiously. So, so there is already sort of a, um, a verbiage around religion as a culture too. And, and, and a, again, a part of our identity or part of our history and, and growing up. And this is what I want to share with you that makes me me. Um, yeah. And even though I don't practice Judaism, I love the food. Oh and, yeah. <laughs> and to, you know, and to, to uh, serve a, not necessarily a Seder meal, but the good <laughs> stuff from the Seder meal, um, you know, is, so maybe, I'm, I'm wondering if we treat religion as culture, if that 
reduces some of the flame <laughs> under it, mm -hmm. um, maybe normalizes it, and and reduces the the altitude. You know, I think mm -hmm. a lot of us treat religion as just high altitude, and then the stakes are higher. Um, and as far maybe, as I or go keep going, keep going. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I'm good. Well, I was just going to say, as far as I know, I mean, Thrive Co-Living Community is not locking the door and keeping everybody in the same place. You know, if, if people want to go to a religious service, <laughs> they are welcome to go. Um, so in this co-living space, you know, to share this part of identity, part of culture, does not prohibit further worship. Um, yeah. At least that's my understanding. You're not locking everyone in, right? Right. Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> pretty, pretty important to put that out there. I, just, I, was, I guess know? I should make sure. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, maybe we say we're not going to hold religious services of any kind. Mm -hmm. You know, and this, there's sort of parallels of this in the public schools where mm -hmm. you can't bring, you can't do religious service there, but you can talk about it and you can have education around it uh there he is or she um may you do education around it but it's not the practice of religion within the schools yeah i don't know what do you think i think rob just <laughs> rob just muted because of the dog <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, that's a good, yeah, that's a good delineation. I think so. Uh, because celebrating lots of things from people's history and their culture, I think will make it a rich tapestry. So yeah, don't worry about it, Rob. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't mute because of the dog. We're happy. And, and we're going to thrive is going to be very dog friendly. Uh, they're just going to have to be on a leash. I'm sending them to you then. I'm sending <laughs> Cliff to you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, any any other closing thoughts? I think we're getting to the to the bottom of this thing. Yeah, I think this is exciting. I, I think just the the for me, there's attractiveness and the openness of it. Um, and and some of my you know best. Uh, religious conversations, if you, if you want to categorize it as religious, ha has been in coffee shops, have, have been on a, on a couch. Um, it hasn't been on a Sunday morning in a worship service. Um, rarely, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know if let my church know this, rarely does it happen on a Sunday morning for me. <laughs> um, it happens during a, a mutual deep connection with the other and in service. Um, so in ways that in which I um, love others, and the ways that I lend a helping hand, the ways that I um, am able to be with other people, that's where I actually feel um, that I'm the most, most worshipful and, and the best version of myself that there is. And I would say that's spiritual. Um, so I, I, I like this, this concept that it's not, you know, Thrive doesn't have sponsored, you know, worship events throughout the week, but um, it is something that is encouraged for the mutual flourishing of all people able to express it in ways and have good, great, deep conversations about how weird and strange the spiritual life may be <laughs> from any <laughs> um, background and experience. But yet it's um, being together in this world, in this life, living together is, is, is really um, the most sacred thing that we can do with the other. That's awesome. Molly, any closing thoughts? Um. I, I feel like I should say ditto to Rob uh, and, and thanks for um, being, being creative and, and um, putting this together and um, creating some energy around it. Uh, we are, we are fans. So <laughs> hope all goes well from here on out, even in the ironic pandemic co-living world. <laughs> Great. Well, again, I really appreciate both of you being here. I knew this would be a, an awesome conversation. The topic, I think, is is very crucial. And uh, just from our from our meetings and conversations, I knew it would be would be great. So I really appreciate the openness that you two have uh, shared with. 
and, and for your support for Thrive. Um, I will remind people that uh, we do have a website. It's at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. And you can uh, catch this podcast and uh, YouTube podcast and all the others are posted there, uh, as well as uh, summaries about what the community is about. So please go and visit and uh, like us on Facebook. We're on all the social media uh, and follow us there. So thanks so much, guys. Let's, um, let's revisit this uh, a little closer to groundbreaking. Uh, and I'd love to have you on to talk about some other things um, as well. So thanks so much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Thrive Co-Living podcast and YouTube broadcast. To discover more about our mission, activities, and how to find us on social media, please check out our website at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. There you can also learn how you can support this creative vision in community co-living. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back soon.